There's a song inside us Makes a prison shake Like a pawn inside us Chains are gonna break Come on, praise Him Come on, praise Him Come on and praise Him
saved us all. Thank you all for singing with us. You can go ahead and take your seats. Well, hey, if we, if we haven't met, my name is James and I serve as, as one of the pastors here. And I just wanna be the first to say happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. Shout out to my own father. We love you guys. Hey, did you know that our heavenly father that created the universe, he personally loves you? I mean, try to wrap that around your minds. I mean, he doesn't just love you in general. He loves you personally. He cares about your life and longs to have a relationship with you. Even if you've stepped away for a while or you've done something to stir up the shame in your heart and you've created some distance. But you know what? This is, this is Father's Day weekend and for a select group of men out there, you have tried for year after year after year to conceive and still no baby. And you would do anything to be a father. My brothers, my heart is with you as I'm going through the same season. And maybe something that I said or, or, or something that you're experiencing, maybe you don't feel very loved at all. You know, think of the person that you love most in your life. Do you know that God loves you even more than that? His love is infinite and unconditional, beyond what any of us are capable of. And every week here at CCV, we take communion to remember God's son, Jesus, who was sent in total and complete love, a sacrifice, a bridge to save me and to save you. You see, he's faithful. He's faithful in the good times and the bads, in the highs and lows, in the light and in the darkness. See, he didn't abandon me and he will not abandon you. And this is what the Lord said to, to Joshua in the Old Testament when Moses passed away. He said, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. He is a good and faithful God. Amen, CCV, let's pray. Father, we, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for your infinite and unconditional love. Father, I pray that someone here today feels your love in the absence of their own father. Father, we can find rest, peace, and restoration in you. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.
seem to tell you to slow There'll soon come a day and it scares me to death When you tell me you're ready to go Well, you're quick as a whip With your hands on your hips On the eyes that could rival your mouth So proudly I'll watch you make the world better off And my prayer is wherever you go May the road rise up to meet you May the wind blow where you lead May the sun shine on your face While the rain falls on your feet May the world lie down before you May you be all you can be But may all those roads Wind home to me Oh, there's lips to be kissed And there's ones to be missed And you won't keep my two cents for long So you'll make your mistakes Like your mom and I did Until one day you stumble on love So may the Lord be kind to keep you May the devil fear your reach May your pockets fill with gold And yet your heart be void of grief May the darkness bow before you May you find the light you seek And may all those roads you roam wind home Listen up, kid, I love you to bits And I wish life would learn to be slow But there'll soon come a day, God, I hope I'm well-aged When I tell you it's my turn to go And death's cruel, I'll admit But mourn for me quick And look after those kids of your own Just make different mistakes And your mom and I make Make our ceiling look like you flow. So may the road rise up to meet you. May your laughter fill the streets. May your children be as kind to you as you have been to me. And when your life's been lived for all its worth, and your grandkids live. roads you won't wind home to me oh may all those roads you won't wind home to me Let's give it up one more time for all the dads out there. Happy Father's Day to you. Well, I just got back from being up north at NAU where we have 3,500 students coming back home. And listen, 
They are on fire for Jesus, all right? And we have some of the students in the audience right now, and I just wanna tell you, God is doing something really special in our student ministry. I wanna thank those of you that are supporting that, those of you that gave to send kids to camp. We are seeing movement and revival, and we're thanking God for that. Amen? Yeah. <clears throat> this, this past week, I got one of the most meaningful notes I think I've ever received in my life. Uh, it was a, a woman in our church that had been on a trip to Israel with my, my daughter and I. We, we were on the same trip, and she wrote me this note. She said, uh, your relationship with your daughter is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, and to be honest, one that I envy with all my heart in the best way that can mean, because I don't have a dad like that. And I, I just wanna acknowledge for a moment that on Father's Day, um, this can be the greatest weekend of some of our lives. And for some of us, it can be the hardest because we didn't have a great dad. And aren't we glad and aren't we honored that we have a heavenly father that can close any gap that we ever felt with our dad here on earth, amen? And that's what God can do. He can close that gap. And I'm just telling you, this weekend, God's gonna speak to us and especially those of us that are dads, because I, I invited a really special guest. His name's John Ty, uh, Tyson. He pastors a church in New York City, an incredible church called Church of the City, and what he's done is he's written a book. He's written a lot on fatherhood. That's one of the reasons I invited him. He also happens to be an Australian. We had an Australian on Mother's Day, if you were here, right? Now we have another Australian. I didn't do that on purpose. I did it because he is really breaking some ground on fatherhood, and I think that's really important in our nation and in our world today. So lean in, take some notes today, and help me give a huge CCV welcome to my friend, John Tyson. Come on, buddy. Come on. Well, it is so great to be with you guys and uh, to celebrate Father's Day together. Uh, I wanna give you a talk tonight, and uh, a talk called How to Become an Intentional Father how to become an intentional father. And I wanna base it from Ephesians chapter six, verse four. Have a, have a listen to this verse. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. This is a powerful verse. And it says that there's a role that a father plays in their kid's life that, that can't be taken away. There's a sacred responsibility that fathers have. But I wanna start with a question tonight, and it's this. It's about our understanding of the time we have to be intentional fathers with our kids. I think that a lot of us view time with our children like this. On one side, our kids are born, and then they live their lives. This is how much we think we have. And then they die, and somehow in our minds, I think we think we're gonna be here the whole time. We're gonna be able to get everything that we want done. We have all the time in the world with our kids. But here's the truth, 95% of the in-person time you will have with your kids will happen before they turn 18. This is actually how time with your kids works. You get them for this window, 95% of it before they turn 18. And then the rest of it is just spaced out over the rest of their lives. And this means that the stakes are high. It goes so quick, doesn't it? Here's my kids in a playground when we first moved to New York. Here's my kids right now. How did that happen? It feels about as quick as that slide that I just showed you. It went so quickly. And dads, I wanna say you are raising your kids in an urgent hour, meaning the things that they are facing are so complex, even compared to when we grew up. Look at some of the issues that they wrestle with how much screen time they can have or how many things come at them because of screens, the challenges of social media, what gender is, sexuality, secularism, anxiety, AI, addiction, self-harm, changing job markets, politics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what young people are saying today is like, who will guide me and who will give me wisdom through the complexity of these issues that I face? And dads, I wanna tell you, you matter. Your role matters. And so I wanna give us a few practical ways to become 
intentional fathers today. So first thing is this, number one, intentional fathers. If you're gonna become an intentional father, you've gotta view your role as sacred. You've gotta view your role as sacred. In my experience and research, there's really only five kinds of fathers and five kinds of ways that fathers view the task they have. And as I'm going through this, maybe ask yourself, what sort of father do you want to be? The first kind is the irresponsible father. This is a dad that gets a woman pregnant and has a kid and then just sort of, that's it. Doesn't view their role as sacred, doesn't stay engaged, doesn't show up, doesn't contribute, doesn't realize that they have brought an image bearer of God Almighty into the world who needs care and direction and hope. Next kind of father is the ignorant father. These are fathers who just weren't given the tools they need to understand uh, how to be a good dad. And being a parent and being a dad is challenging, isn't it? I I certainly didn't, no one sat me down and said, hey, you're about to have a baby and uh, you need to understand childhood developmental psychology. No one ever sort of like came along and gave me wisdom or insight on how to do this. Then you can get inconsistent dads. And then these are dads who are in and out of a kid's life. Yes, they want to be present, but either their brokenness, the issues that they're facing, or their ambition draws them to neglect their children to pursue other things. And then out of guilt comes back. And then there's a cycle of engagement and disengagement. And quite often this can be very painful in a child's life because they they don't have the tools to process why dad keeps leaving. They think it's them causing dad to walk away. And then you get involved dads. An involved dad is a, is a great dad. And it's sad in our world today how many men I meet who say, man, my dad was really involved in my life. An involved dad's a dad that, that shows up at the games, is involved in discipline, uh, gets the big things right, does the sex talk, uh, teaches their kid how to drive a car, Disciplines when you're getting a little cheeky in front of mom, like does the things that a kid needs in order to get through life. And if, you've, if you're sitting here and you've had a dad like this, you know what a blessing it is to have an involved dad. But the thing I, I think that is key about involved dads is they deal in generalities, which means it's general truth based on God's world and what they know. And so it's there and it's present, but it's not customized and specific. And sometimes your general truth may need to go a degree deeper for some specific truth to really get to the heart of the kids that God has given you. And then there's one layer above this, which is the intentional father. And I think the difference between an involved and intentional father is this. An intentional father doesn't start with general principles. They start with the kid's heart that has been given to them and they ask, What does this particular unique child need? And how do I customize my fatherhood to give them exactly what they need? Sometimes, you're aware of this, sometimes there can be things that are generically true, but you need something specific for where you are. And I think the power of an intentional father is they say, Lord, why have you given me this particular kid? What's their unique gifts and personality and calling? And how do I design my fatherhood? Not just projecting what I want into them, but who are they and where is God going to send them and how do I equip them on their journey? And I want to say this, we need intentional fathers today more than ever because of how challenging and complex it is. Dads, I want to say to this, you may be just struggling through right now. You may be asking yourself the question, Is showing up doing anything? Because here's the thing, kids aren't defined by gratefulness. Have you figured that out yet? When you show up and you're like, man, I'm gonna be intentional and you you sacrifice and they're like, you're late or they, they say some other, they don't even acknowledge it. You can ask yourself, is it making any difference? I want you to know it's making more of a difference than you can comprehend right now. Your role as a father is so important and viewing it as sacred is the first step. A lot of dads today uh, have got so much ambition, they don't view it as sacred. Tim Keller says this, we may not actually, he's talking about how in the first centuries, they would have some barbaric religious practices where they would actually offer their children to gods as sacrifices. And he says this in responding to that, we may not actually burn incense to Artemis, but when money and career are raised to cosmic proportions, we perform a kind of child sacrifice neglecting family and community to achieve a higher place in business 
and gain more wealth and prestige. So he says, he's just urging dads, don't sacrifice your kids on the altar of ambition. You matter. Your role matters. Your presence in your home matters. And again, your kids may not tell you now, but there's gonna come a day, 10, 15, 20 years from now, where greatness will not be defined by your accomplishments in your world, but by your presence in your home. So number one, I want you to get this uh, sense here that you've got to view this role as sacred. But I've got good news for you. If you view it as sacred, you're going to have the help of the Holy Spirit to do this. And this is honestly one amazing advantage that we have as followers of Jesus. We get the help of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job is to help. He's called the helper. Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to give you help to get the job done. Now, this passage I read is from Ephesians 6, 4. Do you remember that verse that talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit? The Bible says that you ought to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be unwise, but wise. It says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit be the controlling influence of your life. Well, I don't know if you've ever noticed this. That verse happens in Ephesians chapter 5. And you would expect, based on how most Christians view being filled with the Holy Spirit, that what's going to come next is speaking in tongues and the gifts of the Spirit and miracles. And, but you know what comes next? Marriage, workplace, home. And here's what he's saying. You should anticipate the fullness of the Holy Spirit, not to manifest just at church gatherings or events. It should manifest in your household. And here's good news for you. God will help you in your parenting. You should anticipate being a father with the help of heaven alongside you. I remember so clearly uh, as I was growing up, my dad was a godly man. Godly man. He was a man of prayer. And uh, when I was a teenager, I was not a godly man of prayer, should we say. And uh, I remember once uh, doing something unethical and ungodly against my parents' will. But doing it so well, I knew I had gotten away with it. And I was a little cocky, a little proud about it. I was just like, I think I pulled that one off. And then my, da my dad's like, hey, John, I'm just wondering if we could have a quick chat. Yes, sir, dad. What did you do? Pardon me, sir. No, what did you do? And I don't, my, so my dad did have some uh, very, very strong skills. Sometimes if you say to a kid, what did you do? They can have such a tender conscience, they just vomit it out. I've been down that road before. I said, what do you think I did? I wasn't falling into that bait there. And then my dad went on to tell me my sin. Oh, how did you find out? He said, God told me when I was praying for you. God told you? What does God have to do with parenting? Apparently a lot. And uh, my dad said, listen, I don't parent on my own. I parent with the help of the Holy Spirit. And I pray for you. And I love you. And I want you to know you're not going to be able to get away with stuff that other kids get away with because God Almighty is on my side. And I just remember thinking, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dad, so I want you to know you're not on your own. If you're overwhelmed, if you're struggling, if you think, man, I need help. You know the number one prayer I pray to the Holy Spirit? It's this, help. You're up. You are the helper and I need help, so help. Nothing too profound, but I've been amazed at the amount of times. I remember once when my daughter was going through a season of a little bit of rebellion and uh, she thought she was getting away with things and my son sat her down and said, listen, mom and dad pray for us all the time. God tells them stuff when we do it wrong. If you're going to go through a period of rebellion, you need to have an open rebellion, not a secret rebellion, and just process it with them because they're going to know anyway. I remember thinking to myself, that's what's up. That's what I'm talking about right there. That's generational blessing. Dads, I want you to know, take your role as a sacred role. Do not sacrifice your kids on the altar of ambition because you're doing more in their hearts and their lives than you can ever imagine. First thing, view it as sacred. Number two, intentional fathers deal with their own brokenness so they don't pass it on. This phrase here says, uh, fathers, do not exasperate your children. It says, do not make your children angry. And uh, that's, that's an interesting phrase. I don't think dads consciously wake up and say, let me yell at my kids this morning before breakfast. 
Where's a kid I can yell out to wreck their day? Anyone? No one's up yet. No one intends to do it. But you know where that comes from, that volcanic eruption of anger? When we're under pressure. A lot of times we're like, man, set a good emotional tone. Don't snap, you know. But when the pressure comes, you're like, and particularly this is where I, I get weak. If you haven't seen your kids for a little bit, but you can see in an instant the accumulation of stuff they've done wrong, and you don't know when you're going to see him again in the next couple of days. So you say, let me just go ahead and correct all of that at this inopportune moment. Has anyone ever done that? Or is it just me? It's just me. Okay. <laughs> it's under, under pressure. It's under pressure that our stuff comes out. And so many men today, we feel so much pressure, don't we? Pr- pressure, pressure to live up to the expectations that are put on us. Financial pressure. Pressure not to screw our kids up. Pressure to be good husbands, to provide. Pressure to have an answer for everything in a world that just feels like it's just going out of control. And so you get enough pressure like that, stuff can come up. And it's often unprocessed pain from our pasts. There's a quote from Ronald Rollheiser that says this, whatever pain is not transformed is transferred. Whatever pain is not transformed is transferred, which means the stuff that we have not tended to in our souls under pressure will leak out. And so many men today are unintentionally damaging their kids because they haven't tended to the wounds in their own hearts. So many men today, I meet so many men, and if you were to ask the question, do you have any wounds from your childhood? Man, the, the kinds of stories, some of them dramatic and some of them quite small, but the pain, It's still felt decades later, so real, so strong. I still meet men who say, my dad never told me my entire life that I was loved. It was just an expectation of doing more. Never told that I have what it takes. I have one friend, the most wounding moment of his life, he's had to teach himself to shave in puberty because his dad wasn't around. And for him, it was like, well, I guess this is another thing I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to raise myself as a man. Sometimes it's words. Sometimes it's absence. Sometimes it's physical violence, but we can be wounded in the journey and it gets in our heart. Now I've got to tell you this, a man cannot parent properly without a sense of blessing on his life. If we're controlled by our wounds and our brokenness and our past, if that's not transformed by the grace of Jesus, we would transfer that to our kids under stress. We need blessing. We need blessing. So many men live with an orphan spirit, even though they have biological fathers. It's that sense that <clears throat> you have to earn this. It's a sense that you're unwanted. It's a sense you have to strive. It's a sense that no one's going to show up and protect you or help you, and you're going to have to figure it out on your own. The orphan spirit has a spirit of mistrust, but more than anything, I think the orphan spirit has a scheming spirit. It tries to get for itself what should have been given in blessing by a previous generation. When I think about this, I think about the life of Jacob in the Bible. Jacob is one of what the Bible calls a patriarch. He's one of the fathers of our faith. Many times in the Old Testament, they talk about the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And uh, Isaac had a, some you could describe, a, a promising but traumatic childhood, if you know his story. And he had a son named Jacob, and he had another son named Esau, and there was conflict between them. Esau was like a manly man. He was hairy, he liked to hunt, he was an outdoors guy. And Jacob stayed inside, was proximate to his mother. He was what? It sounds like we would call a mummy's boy. And so sort of the, the time that they lived in, the father would bless the oldest son, and Jacob already had a little bit of an insecurity, when you read into the text, a little bit of an insecurity in his spirit. And so his mum said, I can fix that here. I've got a plan to scheme and make sure that you get a blessing. So here's what his mother said. Okay, when your brother's off one day, I'm going to get an animal and I'm going to cover you with hair so that when you go in and ask for blessing, your father will think it's you because your brother's really hairy and you're not. And this is the first time where he's wearing a costume and a mask to have to scheme to get blessing. Then his mum says, I'm going to cook up some, some of your dad's favorite stew. And so bring that in. So he's smelling the food and he can sense uh, the hair on you and then ask for the blessing. And so here comes Jacob who was following his mother's energy, not his father's. 
And she comes into this scene and, and uh, here comes Isaac. And he's, what does he say? He says, you feel like my son, but you don't sound like him. Let me have some soup or let me have some stew. And then ends up saying, okay, well, I, best, I, I better bless you. And he blesses him and then he runs off. But here's what's happened. He has stolen and schemed for a blessing. It wasn't freely given. And so he knows for the rest of his life that what he has hasn't been given. He's schemed for it. His brother finds out and he's absolutely mad. And so as a result, he has to flee. Now, as he flees, he uh, bumps into a woman, beautiful young woman. The Bible says she was lovely in shape and form. And uh, he falls in love with her. Now, she's got a dad named Laban. And uh, he's like, Laban, I'd like to marry your daughter. He goes, great, seven years of work and you can get married. And uh, Rachel had a sister named Leah. And here's what it says about Leah. She had weak eyes. Lovely in shape and form versus weak eyes. The Bible is telling a story here. But you know what happens? He wakes up after his wedding. He gets a little drunk and he wakes up and he looks next to him and he's like, you don't remember like what I remember you look like. And it turns out that his father-in-law has deceived him. He's given him the wrong daughter. So he has to work another seven years. And do you know what's happening? He sowed scheming for blessing and now he is reaping scheming in return. And then he starts working for his father-in-law and his father-in-law changes his, his wages like 10 times. He eventually has to flee from his father-in-law and he goes through his life and all, everywhere he goes, people are trying to manipulate him and rip him off because he doesn't have a legitimate blessing. And he's getting ready to return home and then one of the most famous scenes in the Old Testament is an angel comes down and wrestles with him and he is in this wrestling match and the angel says, let me go. And what does he say? What's the thing that comes out of his mouth? I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he knows that he has to have a legitimate blessing before he returns back. And he's blessed and he limps and the angel says this, your name, schemer or deceiver, is no longer appropriate. You're going to be called Israel. You're going to be the father of many, many people. And after that, he walks with a limp, but he has a legitimate blessing. And you know what happens from that point on? Blessing, not scheming, begins to follow his life. It's actually a really beautiful and a powerful scene that shows what can happen when a man is blessed. I, I want to say this to you. Is there any untended to wounds in your life? Have you been scheming for a blessing and therefore it's impacting your marriage and your parenting? I can tell you this. This may be a day where God wants to give you legitimate blessing. Here's the beauty of the gospel. You don't have to strive. You're not an orphan. You were loved by the Father and He has chosen you and He wants you and you have a purpose and a destiny and a call on your life and this, this may be the day where you inherit the Father's blessing. We need parenting. We need the Holy Spirit to help our parenting, but we need the Holy Spirit to inherit blessing. And you know what Jesus says? You will have the promise of the Father who is the Holy Spirit. And you know what the Holy Spirit does in a man's life? He gives us the spirit of adoption. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. So I just want you to know today, this could be a day to lean in, tend to those wounds, stop being a schemer or a deceiver, get legitimate blessings, stop that brokenness flowing down into your kids and release the blessing of heaven through your transformation into their lives. An intentional father views their role as sacred. An intentional father deals with their wounds and their brokenness. And number three, an intentional father builds a plan and pathway for the kids' formation. Back to this verse again from Ephesians. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, when you read the Old Testament, they had a very, very rich role of discipleship in the home. There was a way that a dad raised their kids so that they would be marked with love for God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, one of the most important passages in the Old Testament, it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now this is, you know what the goal of this was? The goal was to create an atmosphere where a child could never escape the covenant love of God Almighty. 
Wherever the kid turned, they were like, here is Yahweh. Here is our protection. Here is our deliverer. Here is our savior. Here is our mighty God. But in America today, most kids, even in Christian homes, don't get that kind of intentional formation. A lot of times, homes are built around many other things, academics or sports. And we live in a culture where secularism just dominates. A lot of dads feel like they weren't discipled properly, so they feel like they haven't got something to hand on. But it's one of those things where a man says, I'm going to give something even if I don't have it. I'm going to go get it so I have something to impart. Almost 70% of kids raised in evangelical churches in America today will walk away from their faith in college. People today view 2,800 hours of digital content a year, but only 153 of those are explicitly Christian. So you tell me whose views and whose vision and whose values do you think will most shape a young person's life? And so dads, I want to tell you, build a family altar. Be a, be a priest in your home where you say, you know what, there's going to be a place and there's going to be a time where we pray and we ask God's blessing and we instruct our kids. You can make it super simple. You don't have to be some theologian or some pastor. You can just Pick a little section of scripture or take a devotional and just read about it. Just mark at the center of your home. We are a family choosing the way of the Lord. And then focus on your family culture. There's so much that's put in our world today around family, uh, cultures in the workplace, isn't there? We talk about toxic workplace cultures and that's why <clears throat> HR exists. But I don't think a lot of us think about building our family culture, the traditions and the celebrations and Marking those powerful moments. I tell you, when a dad shows up with a heart to mark powerful moments and work on the culture of their home, it changes the whole household. And then the goal is to build a family immune system. And you know what the immune system does? The immune system is able to fight off illness. And there's so much sickness in our culture today that's trying to rob and steal our children, take their innocence, steal their future. And if you build an immune system strong enough, if that comes in, it should be able to push it out and your family remain healthy. And that's what I think is part of what it means to have a, a way of raising your kids, being intentional in instructing them in the things of God. And then I think it's about giving them a, a pathway over the course of time to walk through this. I particularly, when my kids sort of hit the teenage years, I was like, I have no idea how to take my kids through the valley of the shadow of the teenage years. Like, how am I going to get from here and navigate all of this stuff? Their bodies are filled with hormones. They're trying to separate from their parents and get their own sense of identity. And I'm sitting in New York, it's terrifying. They're just going into the subway system. They're going into the heart of the city on their own. There was so much happening in my heart. And I said, I wonder what other societies have done. Is there like some pathway to help these kids emerge into adulthood? And Because it doesn't seem like there's one in America, does it? You just sort of go to high school and wish you all the best. So I started to do some re research and I realized that almost all societies had a vision of walking from adolescence into adulthood to have a pathway where kids could become mature and godly adults. It looks something like this. Number one, you got to have a vision for a society where people who participate in our sons and daughters grow up and they work for the common good of our society. They're a gift to our world, not a burden or a detriment to it. So to have a vision for the common good, they would often remove children right around adolescence out of the childhood environment so that they wouldn't get stuck with childhood thinking, which is the next phase. They would try and sever them from thinking like children so they could start to think about responsibility and adulthood and how, how to own their faith. And then they were brought into a community environment for training and formation, particularly with young men. This was a huge process in almost every society for young men. And here they would learn three things, the traditions of their people, their ancestors, their history, their cultural story. Next, the skills they needed to be respected as a man in the world. And number three, faith so that they would fear something above themselves. A man who does not fear God is a dangerous man because he acts as if he is God in the world. But a man who fears God will submit to God and live with respect. And so they wanted to shape young men with this vision. Then they were sent out after a period of training to what they called the ordeal. 
and the testing. And the ordeal and the testing uh, was basically designed for the young man to learn this, this idea, I've got what it takes. It's not just a content dump. I can make this work in the real world. And then they're recognized by the community of men, blessed and received and welcomed, so that when they head out into society, they are bringing with them gifts to bless the community of which they are a part. And I remember thinking, man, the Bible tells me that I have to raise my kids with some sort of content and instruction. I need a path. And as far as I can tell, I don't know if there is a path. So I read all these books and I just said, I'm going to create a path. And I called it the primal path. And uh, it sounds like men eating meat without their shirts in the woods, doesn't it? The primal path. But the, the thing is, I just called it that because I wanted my son to be interested in it when he was a teenager. And uh, here's, here's what I basically did. I built this rite of passage. I got a little tribe of dads together and I initiated them at Coney Island where I had them stripped down to run into the ocean. You, this is a baptism into adulthood. You're entering liminal space. This is the death of your childhood. Pretty intense. And uh, next slide here is a, a picture of them sort of coming out all cleaned up. And uh, I, wanted, I wanted them to know, hey man, you're stepping into a journey in a godly masculinity. And then I started just doing like this little Bible study uh, every morning with him. We'd read a, a section of scripture and we'd talk about like, here's, here's what you need to know about God. Here's what you need to know about life. Here's what you need to learn about yourself. And if you can figure out who God is and how life works and who you are, man, you're gonna have a chance to make it. And I remember this, this uh, next one here. This was a really powerful morning. I'd drawn out this whole five-year journey before him on a chalkboard. And it was like the five shifts from being a boy into a man, all the archetypes of men that you need to master, how to map out the whole of your life and what to get right decade by decade. It was this big, long journey. And then one day my son looked at me and he said, Dad, who took you through the primal path? I said, I no one took me through it. He said, well, where did all this stuff come from? I said, well, man, I'm, I made this up and I made it up for you. And he said, what? He said, yeah, man, I did this for you because I love you and I want you to do better than I did, not have the wounds I have and the gaps in your formation. My son looked at me and he cried and he said, dang, I feel really loved. And this is why I said, forgive me, can I take a photo of this moment? This is one of the best moments of my life because it may not look like much, but generational drama is being broken off and blessing is leaking into my son's heart. And then when he graduated, we said, hey man, if I just send you into college, I don't want you to become a statistic and just, so here's what I wanna do. I wanna send you around the world and irreparably break your heart for the global poor by exposing you to the absolute best and worst of the human condition so that you will see what you're up against and you'll take your life seriously. And uh, so he did a gap year that like really messed him up in a very good way. Good messing up, not a bad messing up. And at the end of it, I said, we need to mark this moment, man. And so he, there's this ancient pathway that people have walked for over a thousand years called the Camino de Santiago. And you walk from France to a huge uh, cathedral uh, in Spain. And uh, so when he got back from his gap year to debrief it and to wrap up this journey, we walked 500 miles across Spain together. And each day we recapped the lessons that he learned. And at the end of it, we got to this town called Finisterre. And when you would do this pilgrimage, you would load up, you would load up something you wanted to release at the pilgrimage and let go. And at the end of this pilgrimage, I said to my son, you're leaving adolescence behind and you're going to emerge from this as a man. And uh, he finished by coming to this pilgrim beach and we sat down, we had this powerful ceremony, one of the most intense moments of my life. Letters of blessing read over him by the whole community of men recapping this whole journey and then he runs into the ocean and I yell out in a loud voice, behold, a man emerges from the ocean. And I happen to have my camera, this is my son, he's like, that's what's up. And it was just like a significant moment. And if you were to ask my son today, how do you know you're a man? He would say, I was initiated as a 13 year old. I was brought into a process of formation by a community of godly men. I was taught, tested, and tried. I went on a pilgrimage, and I was marked by a community of men and welcomed into manhood. That's how I know I'm a man. And I gotta tell you, dads, you can do something like that. You can, I only share this with you because no one shared it with me, and I want you to know you can do stuff like this. What did you do for your daughter? That's all everyone says. Man, my daughter, that was complicated. I didn't know what to do, so I just created a thing called 50 Pieces of My Heart. I was like, I got all this stuff in my heart. Let me give you a bit of my heart. And uh, 
There's like 50 things every girl needs to have from her dad before she leaves home. And uh, we'd get up in the mornings and uh, the thing that was challenging about my daughter, my son would have it all on iPad, no problem. She wanted me to print it out, cut it out, tape it in these books so that when she went to college, she'd have a record of this journey. Next slide. So it would take me as long to print out and cut and paste into these books as anything. And it was all built on this idea from Frederick Beekner, who's one of America's best authors of another generation. He's got a quote that says this, here is the world, beautiful and terrible things will happen. Do not be afraid. And so I spent a year telling her about the beautiful things that happen when you walk with God and the terrible things that happen in life because of sin and how she as a young woman has what it takes and do not be afraid. And so we went through this amazing journey and this is, again, I'm about capturing these heartbreaking moments, meaningful moments. This is my daughter walking away after hugging me saying, I wish I had more time for more wisdom. I said, darling, you have everything you need. I bless you. This is all working, walking off to college into her dorm, crying and waving goodbye. Happens so quick. But by the grace of God, my kids at least moved in some godly direction. Now, I acknowledge that I've made it sound, next slide, like this. Well, they have childhood and they've got to get to adulthood and you need like a rite of passage and markers and you need to be a... Can I be honest with you? Can we just be real for a minute? Is that okay? Next slide. This is what it was actually like, okay? It was like hard, complicated. Both of my kids struggled with their faith. Both of my kids went through seasons where their behaviour was not everything I hoped and dreamed when they were born. I mean, we went through this whole crazy process. But at the end of it, I realised the intention of Father only has one ultimate job, one ultimate job, and here's what it is, to point to our Heavenly Father. None of us are going to be perfect dads. We're all going to unintentionally wound our kids. But if we can just create a path where they can see our Heavenly Father, it's going to be enough. It's going to be enough. Our Heavenly Father is extraordinary. He is the perfect Father. And a lot of times I think we live in a world where we just don't believe how good He is. And if we can just get our kids to see that there's nothing they can ever do that will stop God loving them, that there's a home they can always come home to, well, this, this could be everything. When the prodigal son comes home, what does it say? The father moved with compassion, ran out to meet him. And this kid doesn't know how good his father is. And it's going to take you sin to realise it. And he's in the middle of a repentance speech. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm not. And the father's like, stop it, man. Welcome home. He puts the sandals on his feet, robe around him, ring on his finger and says, let's go, man. We're doing brisket. I got, like, I've killed a little cow. We're doing brisket. This is going to be amazing. There's a huge party in your honour. What an amazing thing. God cuts the repentance speech off to start the celebration because He's just happy to have you home. That's the sort of God we serve. He's full of compassion. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love. And so He invites us to help our kids see Him. And that's really what it is. The pathway is to get them to Him. Dads, I want to say to you, you may be here and you may think, man, I've blown it. You may be thinking, I, I couldn't do this, dude. I'm not some pastor. You may be thinking, this is, well, this is great for other guys, but you don't, know, you don't know my family dynamics. I want to tell you something right now. There is so, there's so much power in a father returning in repentance and humility in his home. You have no idea the weight that can happen. So here's the truth. In the Bible, it's the story of the prodigal son, but in modern culture, it's actually the story of prodigal fathers. Fathers are the ones who've run away from their families. And I wanna tell you right now, there's a generation of kids every day looking out for the horizon for dads to come home. And I wanna tell you, dads, your kids will take you home. It's a return of the prodigal fathers to sons who will welcome them back, daughters who will welcome them back for a different kind of party in our world today. Do not neglect, do not doubt the power of what happens when a man repents. I have, a, I have a friend who is a pastor and at pastor's events, they you always ask people, hey, how'd you become a pastor? It's kind of a weird job. How'd you get into the ministry? And uh, I was talking with my friend. I said, hey, how did you become a pastor? And he said, oh man, it's a crazy story. He said, I grew up in a home and my dad was harsh. He was a harsh man. 
And uh, he, he's like, he would come in and as soon as he'd enter into the house, all of us just sort of winced, waiting for what sort of mood he was gonna bring in the house. And uh, he, was, he was aggressive and he was yelling at everybody and he was just like a bitter man, angry about stuff that we didn't deserve or understand. So one day, Dad came home. Something was a little bit different. And he invited us all down and he said, we're gonna have a family meeting. And he said, we'd had family meetings before. And I thought, oh no. He said, Dad came in and he just looked different. And Dad said, would everybody please take their socks and shoes off? So they did. He said, my dad went and got a basin and got on his knees and said to our family, I want to apologise to you for being a harsh man. I've been doing a Bible study with some friends and I've recently given my life to Jesus and Jesus has changed my heart and he's made me understand the ways that I've been treating you and not what it is to be a godly man. I want to ask for your forgiveness. I want to ask for your patience and I want you to know I want to have a different home and I want to be a different kind of man and I want to be a different kind of husband. And so I want to wash your feet in repentance and ask that you would forgive me. My friend said, here is his dad, harsh man, weeping. Here is his dad on his knees, washing their feet. He said, my dad became so different. He was unrecognisable. And he said, I said in my heart as a child, I want to serve whatever God did that for my dad. That's why I'm a pastor. And I want to tell you right now, folks, it is never too late. It is never too late when a man turns in repentance to repair his home. The Holy Spirit comes with power. There's something that God does and blesses when a man does that. And so I wanna just, I wanna encourage you, if you need to do something like that, this is the time. This is the moment. God's heard you hear this talk and this story at this moment now because this is your moment as a father. God is raising up a movement of intentional fathers to repair the brokenness of other generations and release blessing on the children who are in front of it. And God is recruiting you to be a part of it. Dad, dads, let's go. Dads, you're invited to become an intentional father. So I just wanna, I wanna pray for the dads who are out there. I just wanna pray a prayer of blessing over you. I wanna pray the help of heaven. And I wanna pray the grace of God will put a resolve inside of you that says, I will become a father like that. So let's pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, in your mercy and your kindness, that you would just bless the fathers who are hearing this talk. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will give grace for their wounds. I pray that you will give them vision for their families. I pray that you will give them the capacity to repent and repair the damage that they have done. And Lord, I pray that they would do this with godly resolve to leave an inheritance for their children. Lord, we acknowledge we can't do this on our own. We acknowledge in our flesh we're gonna fail time and time again, but we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you were here to help us, to empower us, to guide us. So I just pray the favour of heaven, the wisdom of God Almighty, that you would give keys to the heart of each child, to each of these dads. I pray bless their homes, show them mercy, and give them vision for the days ahead. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, it's been so great to be with you today. See you next week.